Hi, everybody. Hi, Mike. Hi. Let's get started. Um, welcome back to Teaching the Bible Cover to Cover. Tonight, we're going to cover the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, so it's going to be intense, and uh, hopefully it goes very well. Uh, let's start off with prayer. Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. God, thank you for gathering us all here together to hear your word. Please bless all of us and take care of us in this coronavirus flu season and everything that's going on. Please protect us. Please make it so that you speak through me so that I teach your word accurately to everybody. May we all learn your word and use it in our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're going to be covering the death and resurrection of Jesus today. And kind of everything was leading up to this. So let's get started. Um, we finished last week. We covered basically the reasons why the, we covered teachings of Jesus, but then we also covered the reasons that the Pharisees or the religious leaders gave for wanting to, to kill Jesus. And, and so we're going to get into it today. Now it's going to cover Passover week, um, which is Holy Week in our church, you know, and basically that's kind of where everything starts. Jesus enters Jerusalem to begin Passover week, and it ends with them hailing him as the king and the Messiah, or it starts with them hailing him as the king and the Messiah, it ends with them crucifying him just a few days later. So, the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest Caiaphas. Caiaphas was kind of the ringleader of wanting to kill Jesus. You know, there was other people that wanted to, but he was the, the head, the, the authority, and he was also the high priest that year. But not all the religious leaders wanted to kill him. Some didn't, but either the majority did or the most powerful ones did. They plotted together to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. However, they did not want to, to do it during the Passover feast to uh, do an uproar among the people. So they kind of wanted to grab him secretly. And, you know, not publicly because they're afraid that, you know, a lot of people thought he was a prophet. A lot of people thought he was Messiah. So they wanted to do it, on, on, you know, behind the scenes at night so that nobody would see them doing it. Jesus and his apostles and disciples entered Jerusalem for the Passover feast. Jesus knew this Passover feast would end with this crucifixion in just a few days. Jesus had two disciples get him a donkey to ride on into Jerusalem. This was done to fulfill the Old Testament prophecy, which is Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, which said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteousness and having salvation is he humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now most of the crowd, when he entered Jerusalem, riding on this donkey, you know, it was prophesied that their king would come that way. Uh, and this is a Passover feast, so everybody descended on Jerusalem. The, the, the city was absolutely filled with people. And most of the crowd started spreading their cloaks on the road. And they pulled palm, palm branches down. So, you know, Jesus' feet are always on a donkey, so nothing would touch the ground. That's where you get Palm Sunday from. And, um, you know, as he was walk, riding on a donkey in the town, and they were putting palm branches down, the people were walking before him as they are putting him down and shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And the whole city was stirred up with joy and excitement that Jesus was coming to town. But how this would quickly change within just a matter of days. When Jesus entered the town, he told his apostles that he would soon be killed. For example, he told them that when they entered Jerusalem, he would be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes. They would condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, which are the Roman soldiers. And he would be mocked and flogged, which is brutally whipped or scourged, and then crucified. But after this, he'd be raised on the third day. And for whatever reason, the apostles either didn't understand what he was telling them or, or couldn't believe what he was telling them, because up to now, he was, of course, God, doing all these miracles. And like, what do you mean you're going to be killed? Like, it wouldn't register with them what he's trying to tell them. Now, Jesus gave directions to his disciples on where they were to prepare room for the Passover. And this would come to be known as the Last Supper. The apostles were directed to a large upper room for this gathering for the Passover, which would be the Last Supper. As they were eating, Jesus told his 12 apostles that one of them would betray him. 
And they all were kind of shocked, and they all started saying, "It's not I, Jesus. It won't be me, will it? It's it's not. It won't. It's not me, is it?" And John, his best friend out of the apostles, was kind of leaning up against Jesus. And Peter got his attention and said, John, ask Jesus who's going to betray him. So he did. Uh, John asked Jesus who's going to betray him. And Jesus said, whoever I dip this, I'm going to dip my bread into the cup. Whoever I give this to is going to be my betrayer. And he, he dipped his bread into the cup and he gave it to Judas. You know, And they didn't tell everybody. It was just kind of like John and Peter kind of knew this. And then Jesus said to him, go to Judas, go quickly and do what you're about to do. Now, John and, and, and Peter thought, or the other apostles thought, he was sending them just like on an errand, you know, because he was telling them, go get an upper room, go get a donkey. So they didn't realize that he was telling them, go do what you need to do, it's time to betray me. And um, Judas left. Now, uh, G Judas previously, before this, went to the chief priests, and he made a deal with them uh, to betray Jesus. You know, one of the reasons why they needed somebody to betray him was it would be uh, the Roman soldiers mostly. It would be some uh, officials and, and the chief priest officers to grab Jesus. But all these people came to Jerusalem, and they are going to do it at night. They didn't. Everybody had beards. They didn't really know who was Jesus. I mean, anybody could have been Jesus, you know, in the group. So they needed somebody that knew him to say, that's him. And Judas uh, was paid 30 pieces of silver by the Pharisees to be the one to hand over Jesus when they came to get him. So they're having the Last Supper. They're having a Passover feast. And as they're eating, Jesus took bread. And after he blessed it, he broke it and gave it to them. And he said, this is my body. And he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave, he gave it to them and said, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. And in a Mass, we recreate this every, every time at the end of the Mass. And it's to honor Jesus in, in giving his body and his blood for us. At, you know, and he did this at the Last Supper. Then Jesus said, Truly I say to you, I will not drink again the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now after Last Supper, they all went out to the Mount of Olives. It was Jesus and his apostles and I guess some of the disciples. And Jesus told him, he said, You will all fall away, for it is written, which was in Zechariah 13 to 7, is prophesied. He said, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Now Peter said to him, Even though they will all fall away, I won't. And Jesus said to him, Peter, truly, truly, I say to you, this very night before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter said, absolutely not. I'll go to prison with you. I'll go to anywhere. Even if I have to die, I won't deny you. And they all said the same thing. So Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane, to pray. And he took his inner circle. Out of the apostles, the three closest were Peter, James, and John. And he took Peter, James, and John alone with him as he went to pray. And Jesus said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Now Jesus walked away a little bit, and he fell on his face, and he prayed to God the Father. He said, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. He was scared. Don't forget, he was God, he was human. He knew what they were going to do to him. And he wanted to save everybody, but he's asking God, is, if there's, please, if there's any other way to save everybody, please do it another way. But... Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And God the Father told him, if you want to save everybody, there's no other way. So Jesus returned after praying that to God the Father, and he found the apostles asleep. He woke them up, and he told them to be on guard, and he returned to praying. And he said, My Father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And Jesus returned to the apostles, and he found them sleeping again. And he went and he prayed to the Father, God the Father, a third time, and he prayed the same thing. And he returned, and the apostles were asleep, and he told them, wake up, the betrayer's here. Now Judas knew where Jesus was going to be at, because he was just with them at the Last Supper. He was with all of them. He knew they are going to the Garden of Gethsemane. So Judas came to the Garden of Gethsemane with a band of soldiers, and it says in some place it might have been as many as 600. Like, it wasn't just a few. And some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees. 
Now Judas drew near to kiss Jesus, which was a signal to the guards with him. The guy that I kiss is, is Jesus. He's the one that you grab. And as he drew near to kiss him, Jesus said to Judas, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? And then Jesus walked forward and said to the soldiers, Who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, I am he. And when he said that, they drew back and fell to the ground. So some power must have come out of him, you know, because they, they all fell over when he said that. And then um, Jesus asked them again, Who do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I told you I am he. Now, you know, if you seek me, just take me and let the others go. And I think he knocked them over like that because they could have just grabbed all of them, all the apostles around them up, and he just wanted him grabbed. So he let them know. He knocked them over just by, by his voice to power out of them. So he said, I'll go with you. Let them go. And I'm like, cool, whatever you say, you know. And it said, um, they listened to Jesus, and this was done to fulfill a prophecy that Jesus earlier gave, which was, out of those whom he gave me, Father, I have not lost one except the son of destruction, which was Judas, so that the prophecy might be fulfilled. Now, at this point, Peter was with Jesus. He was Peter, James, John, the other ones. And you're going to see this play out not just here, but later, but also in the book of Acts. When Peter was with Jesus, he was very brave. As soon as he was separated from Jesus, he wasn't. And later, you know, Peter's going to let them know after he's risen from the dead, they don't want Jesus to leave. And Jesus tells them, I'm telling you, it's better if I go, because if, if I don't go, the helper won't come. But if I go, the helper will come and be with you, you know, and live inside of you. When Peter's with Jesus, he's brave. As soon as he's separated, he wasn't. It, it, later, when the Holy Spirit answers him, Jesus is willing to be crucified upside down, you know, uh, and he won't stop talking about Jesus. And the difference is God was now living inside of him. So having God living inside of him is even better than having him next to you, because you could be separated from him. So now Peter's with Jesus. All these soldiers are coming to grab Jesus, and he's with them. He's brave. He pulls out his, his sword, and he wants to take them all on. He starts swinging at them. And um, he hits the, the servant of the high priest, and he cuts his ear off. And Jesus said to Peter, You put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup that my father has given me? You know, don't, don't fight to free me. This is what I came for. I came here to die for all of you. And then Jesus bent down, he touched the ear of the servant of the high priest that was cut off, and immediately his ear was healed. And then the band of soldiers arrested Jesus and took him to the Jewish religious leaders um, that ordered his arrest. And the head of this was Caiaphas, the high priest. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for any kind of testimony they could use against Jesus to put him to death. Now many false witnesses came forward, but their testimonies contradicted each other. And they wouldn't hold up. Now, Jesus remained silent during all of this as they're accusing him of whatever. Because remember, he came here to die. He didn't come here to defend himself. He didn't come here to argue his way out of a death sentence. So he didn't say anything to defend himself. And then finally, the high priest, which is Caiaphas, said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you're the Christ, the Son of God. Now, think about this. The Bible says that the Christ is going to come. The Bible says that the Messiah is going to come. Jesus did all these miracles, you know? So he, he said, tell us if you're him. One is coming. And Jesus said, you have said so, but I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man, him, seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. He says, yeah, I am. At this, the high priest tore his robes and said that Jesus uttered blasphemy by saying he was the Messiah. And they need no more witnesses since everyone heard his blasphemy. And he asked the religious leaders, what is your judgment? And they answered to Caiaphas, he deserves death. And then they spit in Jesus' face and they start beating him. And they're slapping him in the face saying, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? Now earlier in the day before Jesus was arrested, the apostles were arguing amongst each other about which one was going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven out of the twelve of them. You know, you heard earlier about how, how Jesus said, I, you know, you're going to deny me three times. Oh, I won't. He joined the conversation because they're, they're arguing with each other, I'm going to be the greatest. I'm going to be the greatest. I'm, now, Jesus is about to be crucified. And, and what they care about is who's going to be the most popular, who's going to be the, the best in the history books. So go back a couple hours. Earlier in the day, 
before Jesus was arrested, the apostles were arguing about which one the people are going to think is the greatest out of the twelve of them. And Jesus entered this prideful and arrogant conversation, and he confronted Peter specifically. And he told Peter, before the day is over, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times, Peter. Peter said he would, this would absolutely not happen. He said he'll follow him anywhere, he'll go even to death, but he's never going to deny him. And Jesus reaffirmed that, Peter, in fact, you're going to deny knowing me three times today. Not like a while from now, you're going to deny knowing me three times today. Now fast forward to present events. Jesus was being tried by the religious leaders inside of an official building in Jerusalem. Peter was outside with the crowd warming himself by the fire, kind of rubbernecking to see what's going on. Now a servant girl approached Peter. Now Jesus, Peter would just want to take on the whole throng of soldiers. He wanted to fight. Now he's separated from Jesus. And a little girl comes up to him. And this little girl says, this man was with Jesus. And Peter said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he left and he went over here. And then another girl came up to him a little while later and said, you were with Jesus. And Peter took an oath, swearing to God, swearing, I don't know, I don't know Jesus. I wasn't with him and I don't know him. And then shortly after, some more bystanders came up and said, we know you're with Jesus because you have the same accent that he does. And he started cursing and swearing and cursing. I never knew the man. Just as the words are coming out of his mouth, they happen to bring, be bringing Jesus out of the building. And as Peter swore and cursed, I never knew the man, Jesus looked at him. And as the words are coming out of his mouth, he caught the eyes of Jesus. And he remembered that Jesus told him, you're going to deny me three times today. And he just freaked out and just started hysterically crying and he ran away. Now the men who were holding Jesus in custody were making fun of him as they spit on him and they beat him. And they, were, they blindfolded him now and they kept asking him as they, they hit him, prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? And they kept spitting on him. They said many other things against him as they bla blasphemed him. Now Jesus was brought now before Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate was a Roman governor who was ruler over Jerusalem. Remember the Roman Empire conquered Israel at this time. And uh, it was under Rome's authority. Pilate was the guy kind of in charge of Jerusalem. So the religious leaders brought Jesus to Pilate. And they told Pilate they brought Jesus to him because he was misleading the people of Israel. He was forbidding people to pay taxes to Caesar, which was a lie. He never said that. And he was also causing problems because he said he was the Christ and the king. Well, he did say that, and it's true. Pilate questioned Jesus. And after thoroughly questioning him, Pilate told the chief priests and the crowds he did not find Jesus guilty of anything. Now, after that, they kept pressuring Pilate, the religious leaders, and they kept telling Pilate Jesus was a troublemaker and he was stirring up the crowds and he was a Galilean. Pilate says, he's a Galilean. Pilate wanted nothing to do with Jesus because he knew he was an innocent man. They are just envious of him. Oh, so he's, he's from Galilee. That's King Herod's jurisdiction. King Herod's in town for the Passover feast. King Herod needs to judge him. I, 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 he's not under my authority. Take him to Herod. Um, so they did. And they brought him to King Herod, and they hoped that King Herod now would find a reason, would agree with them, they need to be put to death. Now, King Herod was excited to see Jesus, just for the entertainment value. He heard this guy was doing miracles all over. He's like, ooh, Jesus is coming, maybe do some miracles for me. That would be really cool. Let's see him do some tricks for me. That's, that's why he wanted to see Jesus. So they brought him to him, and he asked Jesus to do a miracle, and Jesus remained silent. And he questioned Jesus, and Jesus wouldn't say anything. And the, the chief priests and scribes kept making accusations of Herod against Jesus, and Jesus, Herod kept questioning Jesus and saying, well, show me a miracle and do this. He wouldn't say anything. Because, again, he, he didn't want to defend himself. He came here to die, not to defend himself. Well, Herod got frustrated at Jesus because he wouldn't talk, and he wouldn't do a miracle to entertain him. So he put him in all kinds of outlandish fancy clothes to make fun of him. And then he sent him back to Pilate. Now when Jesus was brought back to Pilate, Pilate brought Jesus back alone to talk to him again. And he said Jesus to Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus says, My kingdom is not of this world. 
my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. And St. Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who hears my voice hears truth. And Pilate said, What is truth? After questioning him in depth, Pilate came out again. And he said to the chief priests and the people, You brought Jesus to me, accusing him of misleading the people. I have thoroughly examined him. I did not find this man guilty of any of the charges you made against him, neither to King Herod. Nothing deserving death has been done by Jesus. Therefore, I will punish him and set him free. Well, how would he punish him if he didn't do anything? Probably just to appease the crowd. He really did not want to put Jesus to death. He was kind of afraid of him, but he also knew he was innocent. So he thought, well, if, maybe if I punish him, that'll be enough, and, and they'll be, you know, that they'll be satisfied with that. Now the religious leaders would not stop demanding that Pilate condemn Jesus to death. So Pilate tried to set Jesus free. He knew Jesus was innocent of charges that the religious leaders accused him of, and they were just envious of him. So what he did was he said, "Okay." Um, we have a Passover tradition every year where we release one prisoner back to, you know, the Jews that, that we have in prison. So he gave him a choice. Um, I'll give you a choice who to release. Jesus, and he picked the worst guy in the prison. This guy's named Barabbas. who's a murderer and an insurrectionist. He'd be like picking the, you know, the, the, the child molester, the one that everybody hates. And he figured, no way are they going to want Barabbas released. You know, it's like releasing Charles Manson. There's no way that they're going to want him released. So he said, which one? I release one. Jesus or Barabbas? And the religious leaders came into the crowd. Release Barabbas. Release Barabbas. Come on. We're the, follow me. We're the priests. I'm telling you. Jesus, he, he's a heretic. Release Barabbas. And he whipped up the crowd, and they all started saying, release Barabbas. So, okay. All right. And he released Barabbas, and he kept Jesus in custody. So Pilate made another attempt to not condemn Jesus to death. And he tried to appease the bloodthirsty crowd that the religious leaders, you know, stirred up. He, he ordered Jesus to be severely flogged or scourged or whipped. Anybody see the movie The Passion of the Christ? The whipping scene? Yeah. Okay. And he wanted it to be severe so that, so that you know, hopefully that will satisfy them. And it, in the Bible, you know, in the movie they turned him over and they whipped the front of him. It doesn't say that in the Bible. It is clear in the Bible. They whipped him with whatever they used so much his whole back split open. Okay, And after they got whipping him, they, they split his whole back open from the whipping. Then the soldiers grabbed him and they brought him into the governor's headquarters. And they put a purple cloak on him to make fun of him and he's a king. And they made a crown of thorns and put it on his head. Now we talked about that earlier. You know, in, in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, God said to Adam and, and Eve, you know, because of this sin, the ground is cursed, and whatever you try to grow out of it, just going to produce thorns because of your sin. They make a crown of thorns, basically, you know, the symbol of the sin. They put it right in Jesus' head. And they kept hitting him in the head with the reed, and they kept spitting on him and making fun of him. Hail, hail, king of the Jews. And when they got done whipping and beating him, Scripture says, not just this, but also crucifixion events, that he was beaten so badly that he wasn't recognized as a human being. Not only was he, they couldn't tell it was Jesus, they said he couldn't even tell he was a human being. And that came from Isaiah. Uh, they prophesied this, chapter 52, verse 14. It said, As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. He was just a bunch of shredded meat by the time this is all finally finished. Pilate brings Jesus back out to the crowd after this. You know, and he's beaten so badly, Pilate hoped that the crowd would feel that's enough. And, and he yells out to the crowd, he brings him out, and he goes, Behold the man! Which means, look at him! Isn't that enough? I mean, Jesus was a mess by then. And the chief priest kept yelling, Crucify him! So, he, Pilate decided, No, I'm not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to release him. I'm not going to crucify him. And then they backed Pilate into the corner that he couldn't get out of. They, the chief priest said, Hey, Jesus says he's a king. We have no king but Caesar. If you release him, you're releasing a guy 
that says he's king in place of Caesar. You're no friend of Caesar. Well, what's he going to do now? I mean, Caesar was the emperor. If this guy, and Jesus said he was a king, is saying he's a king, possibly in place of Jesus, or in place of Caesar, and Pilate releases him, Caesar might have him executed. So they got him. You know, he, he, there's nothing really he could do uh, other than risk his own life of being executed for this guy he doesn't even know. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that an actual riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I'm innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And then they delivered him up to be crucified. Jesus was led away by the Roman soldiers and made to carry his own cross. They forced a man named Simon of Cyrene to help him carry his cross. They brought Jesus along with two other criminals who were to be crucified to a place called Golgotha, which means a place of the skull. A great multitude of people and groups of women were following Jesus, grieving for him for what was happening to him. It was there they crucified Jesus, along with one of the criminals on his right and one on his left. And as they were crucifying him, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Pontius Pilate wrote an inscription and put on the cross, and it said, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. It was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek, so everyone could read it. They offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall. That was, from what I understand, that was actually like a painkiller. And, um, you know, he's like, no, no, I, I can't, you know, I mean, I'm, I can't kill the pain. I'm, I have to suffer, you know, that's why I'm here. And when he tasted the gall, he refused to drink it. The Roman soldiers divided Jesus' garments among them, but his tunic was seamless. It was kind of woven in one thing, there's no seam on it. They couldn't, they wanted to cut up in pieces, but they couldn't. So instead of tearing it or dividing it, they cast lots for it, they gambled for it to see who would get it. And all of these events have been prophesied about Jesus by the prophets in the Old Testament. And they can be found in this Bible summary. You know, we already covered it in the uh, prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament. Now, we're going to go back a little bit. This is really interesting and important. You're going back to when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Remember that? That's right when he started his ministry. Why was that important? It was important because... Jesus had remained sinless for this, his payment for our sins. He had to be unblemished. He had to remain sinless his whole life. If he sinned, he couldn't be used as a sacrifice. God the Father wouldn't accept it as a payment of, of, for our sins. So if the devil could get him to sin, at least this plan by God would have been all over. And the, God let him get a shot at Jesus, you know? So Jesus, here, this was, again, back right as Jesus started his ministry of temptation in the wilderness. Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He did this to prepare for his mission to save us from sin. He fasted for 40 days and nights. He didn't eat any food and he was hungry. At that time, the devil came to tempt him to sin and said, and listen to the phrasing. This is the devil trying to tempt Jesus to sin. The devil said, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. I know you're hungry. Now, God the Father told Jesus to fast and not eat. And if Jesus ate, he would have sinned against God because he would have went against what God told him to. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took Jesus to the top of the Jewish temple, and he said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and in their hands they will catch you against your foot so that your foot will not strike against the stone. Jesus said to the devil, Again it is written, You shall not put your God to the test. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And he said to him, and this is important too, we'll get to this in a minute. The devil said to Jesus, To you I will give all this authority in their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. If you then, worshiping me, if you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And then Jesus said to him, 
Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you serve. And when the devil ended every temptation for Jesus to sin, he left him, waiting for another opportunity to destroy Jesus. When's a time when Jesus might even be weaker than fasting for 40 days? When? He's on the cross, right? Listen to the devil's phrases when he's trying to tempt him. If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down for his angel to catch you. Jesus is on the cross now. If Jesus, if it's too much for Jesus to take being crucified, I can't take the pain. I, you know, I ended, if he pulled himself off the cross or stopped, it would have been all over. So Jesus is on the cross now. And the rulers are in front of Jesus, the people that, that ordered him up there. And they say to him, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one, if he's the Son of God, save himself. Ah, you who destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from that cross. The Roman soldiers and the two criminals crucified on both sides of Jesus said the same thing at first. One of the criminals said, If you are the Christ, save yourself and save us too. You think maybe the devil is trying to go through these people get them to pull himself off the cross? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. He doesn't say it. But man, it sounds the same, you know. It sounds like the same phrasing, and he's looking for another opportunity to destroy him. He wasn't weak enough to get him when he was fasting. When's the only time he'd be weaker? You know, if Jesus pulled himself off the cross, and he could have, he's God, it would have it ended. It would have been over. So, you know, the one criminal then says, if you are the Christ, save yourself and save us too. But the other criminal, who was criticizing him in the beginning, came to believe in Jesus. He said to the one who said, you know, if you're the son of God, pull yourself off the cross and save us. He said, don't you fear God? We deserve our punishment for our bad deeds. But he did nothing wrong. And then the criminal said to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to the criminal, truly, truly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now, standing at the foot of the cross was Jesus' mother, Mary. His mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, and his friend John. He was the only apostle that didn't run away. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, which is the apostle John, standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to John, Behold your mother. And from that day on, the apostle John took her into his own home. Basically, he said, John, you're my best friend. Take care of my mom. Mom, I'm going. I'm your son. He's going to be your son from now on. And his best friend took care of Mary for the rest of her life, I guess. Now between the sixth and the ninth hour, the sun's light failed, and there was darkness over the whole land. In the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but I heard a lot of very, very reputable Bible teachers. And a lot of them think that when he said that, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the point in the crucifixion where the whole sins of the world was placed on Jesus. And he was bearing our sins and God the Father was unleashing his wrath on our sins on Jesus as our sacrifice. No way to prove it, but, but there's a lot of people that seem to believe that. Now, one of the bystanders filled a sponge with sour wine and gave it to Jesus to drink. And he said, let's see if Elijah will come and take him down. Now, after Jesus drank the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Then Jesus called out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now, since it was a day of preparation, which some kind of holy day, I guess, don't know exactly what it is. And so the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, and they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first, and of the other who had been crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, saw he was already dead, they did not break his legs. And even not understand what the breaking of the legs were. Okay. When you're crucified, what actually killed the person, they're hanging like this. And the position that they hang them is they got weak. The weight of their body would compress against their, their lungs, and they couldn't breathe after a while. And if they hung there long enough, they would actually die from suffocation. 
right? So what would you do if you're hanging there? You try to hold yourself up so you could breathe. Well, if you break their legs, they can't hold themselves up anymore. So um, the Jews said, the chief priests said, hey, it's a holy day coming. We don't want people on the cross for this holy day. Let, let's kill them, get them out of here, break their legs, and they'll die. So he broke the legs of two criminals. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead. And one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And when he did, blood and water came out of his side. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not, not one of his bones would be broken. Despite all they did to him and mashed him up, I guess no bones were broken. And another scripture prophecy says, they look on him who they pierced. Now, when this happened, the curtain in the temple was split from top to bottom. Anybody understand what that means? Anybody not understand what that means? Okay, good. So back in the, the Jewish temple, right, there was this curtain, and behind the curtain was the Holy of Holies. They thought, well, not thought, but, but God was back there. And nobody could go back there. Only once a year, the high priest would go back there for just a few minutes and do something with God back there or do whatever, because God was back there, man's out here in this curtain separated, and he weren't allowed back there. When Jesus died for our sins, there was no separation from God with us now. He became, a, a, you know, the intercessor between us and God the Father. There was no, we could go to Jesus with anything. We have access to the Father now because of Jesus. So immediately the curtain was, was ripped from top to bottom, which means man has access to God now because of what Jesus did for us. But aside from the curtain ripping itself, um, there were earthquakes and rocks split open. Dead people got out of the graves like zombies. I don't know if there were zombies, but dead people got out of the graves and are walking around town. And uh, they walked around the city, and the people who climbed out of the graves who were dead appeared to many people. Many people were witnesses of this. Now, when this was happening, when a centurion who, and those who were with Jesus at the crucifixion saw all these events, where like, all everything was breaking loose, you know, they were filled with awe, and they said, truly, he was the son of God. Now, this is a Roman centurion who crucified him. Now many in the crowd who saw all these events went home sad, and they were mourning for what happened to Jesus. Many women who were, who were there who followed Jesus from Galilee, and other women who came up from Jerusalem who had been ministering to him, included Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Now there's a rich man at this time named Joseph from Arimathea. He was a member of the council. Like I said, not every religious leader was against Jesus. Some recognized him as a Messiah and accepted him as a Messiah. You know, other ones either didn't recognize him or, yeah, he might be the Messiah, we're still going to call him. But, but there was a minority who followed him from the religious council, and one was Joseph of Arimathea. Um, he did not vote Jesus to be guilty. He voted to, that he's innocent, and he came to be a follower and a believer in Jesus. Now, Joseph asked Pontius Pilate if he could have Jesus' body after the crucifixion and bury it, and Pilate gave it to Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph buried Jesus in his own tomb, which is a new tomb out of rock. Things changed. How did Jesus come into the world? A filthy manger, no room at the end, swaddling clothes, you know. Now, he's, now, you know, now his mission's over. Joseph gives him, he's a rich man, he gave him this brand new tomb that was his, that was freshly carved out of rock. There's no more living like a pauper for Jesus and everything, you know? I mean, he, he did his mission. Um, the next day, the Pharisees went to Pontius Pilate, and they said, listen, this Jesus that we crucified kept saying after three days he's going to rise from the dead. You know, and if his apostles or disciples come to steal the body, it's going to be even be worse than who's here because they're going to think he rose from the dead. You need to secure the tomb. So Pilate said, I'll give you a guard of soldiers. A guard is four soldiers. I looked it up. You know, it was four soldiers that every four hours, four more would come and relieve them. OK, so there's always four soldiers there and they wouldn't get tired because after four hours, four more would come. Now, the thing back then, and you see in other parts of the Bible, if you're guarding somebody, your life relies on it. Like if I'm guarding you and, you're, and you get away, they're gonna kill me because I failed on the job of guarding you. So if these Roman soldiers who were supposed to guard Jesus' tomb, somehow you know, they stole the body, they would all be put to death because they messed up on the job. So they had these four soldiers there, but also they put this big rock over the tomb that Jesus was in, they sealed it in. 
okay? And um, that's how it ended on, on you know, Good Friday when, when he was crucified. Now on the first day of the week, a group of women who knew Jesus went to his tomb with spices they prepared. When they got there, an earthquake took place because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. He rolled away the stone that was covering the tomb and he was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. And when this happened, it says in quotes, for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Jesus' body was gone from the tomb and it was empty. Now the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. He has risen for, as he said. Come see where he lay. And he brought him in and showed them where he was laying. And he's not there anymore. He said, now go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he's going to Galilee before you. You're going to see him there. Now see, I've told you. Now go do what I told you to do. And the woman ran with great joy. As they're running back to Galilee, Jesus appeared to them. And he said to the women, Greetings, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and they'll see me. And the woman grabbed Jesus and they worshipped him. Can you grab a ghost? No, they grabbed him and tackled him. We're kissing him, hugging him. And oh my God, we can't believe it's you and worship him. He was back as a person. Now, the soldiers guarding the tomb, you know, this angel came, rolled the stone away. Jesus is gone. They're like this because, you know, everything was happening. And they went and they told the religious leaders what happened. And the religious leaders gave them a big pile of money and said, don't worry, we'll take care of the people in charge of you. We're going to pay them off too. You know, tell everybody that you all fell asleep. And while you're asleep, his disciples came and stole the body. Don't worry. I know normally if you lose, you'll get killed, but we're, we're, it's okay. We're going to pay them off. So that's what they did, which can't happen. You know, I mean, if you lose a soldier or if you lose the person you're guarding, they'll put you to death. Right now, there's four. of them. What's the chance of all four of them falling asleep? If they're all asleep, how do they know the disciples came and stole the body if they're all asleep? Like nothing makes sense. And they put this big rock in front of it. So while all four are sleeping, the disciples came and ripped this big boulder out and moved it. And none of them woke up and they stole the body and none of them woke up. But they all knew that the disciples, like it, it didn't plan out. But that's the only story they had because they didn't have a story because Jesus rose from the dead. There was no story. Now, the apostles were gathered together. They were hiding in fear of the Jews who crucified Jesus. So they're afraid now. Again, they're not with Jesus. You're going to see how brave they get once the Holy Spirit comes to them in the book of Acts. So they're hiding and they're afraid that they're going to get arrested. They're going to do the same thing to them. And Jesus appeared in their midst. And he said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven of them. If you withhold forgiveness of any, it is withheld. Now Thomas wasn't with them when Jesus appeared, and he wouldn't believe that Jesus appeared to them. He said, unless he was able to see the nail marks in Jesus' hand and place his hand in, in the, the wound in Jesus' side where he stabbed him with the spear, he would not believe that it was Jesus that appeared to him. Eight days later, they're all together, and Thomas is with them this time, and Jesus appears to them again. And he says to all of them, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Thomas, put your finger in, my, in my, the hole in my hands, and put your hand in my side. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to Thomas, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. That's us. Jesus appeared to the apostles once again. He sat down this time to have a talk with Peter. Remember the last time he saw Peter? Peter was denying him three times. In his conversation with Peter now, after Jesus was resurrected, he said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Then Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, John, son of John, do you love me? Peter said, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. And then he said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
Now Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my sheep. It doesn't say exactly what happened, but I think, you know, Peter denied him three times. Jesus allowed him to tell him to his face three times, No, I love you. You know, to make up for it. But then Jesus said to Peter, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was a glorified God. He was telling Peter, you're going to be crucified one day like I am. And after saying this, he said to Peter, follow me. What was the first thing he said to Peter when he met him? He was a fisherman. Follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. He's given like a clean slate, second chance. At another time, when Jesus appeared to the apostles after he rose from the dead, he gave them the Great Commission, which is what we're doing here. This is the instruction he gave to his followers, which includes us to do. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. That's what we're doing now, to honor God. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now what is interesting in the above passage is the authority over the kingdoms of the world was given back to Jesus after his crucifixion, after he completed his Father's will of dying as a sacrifice for us. Now remember the statement Satan made to Jesus when he was trying to tempt him in the, in the wilderness. And the devil took Jesus up and showed him all of the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said, it, said to Jesus, To you I will give all this authority and their glory, for it has been delivered to me, and I give it to whom I will. And Jesus didn't refute this statement. He didn't say, You're lying, Satan. You know, but he said, I'm not going to follow you. Now, after Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead, in the Great Commission, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus defeated Satan and got the authority back that was lost when Adam and Eve sinned and it brought sin into the world. After Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to the apostles and other people multiple times over a 40-day period. He kept appearing over 40 days. On one occasion, he appeared to a group of over 500 people. Jesus then told the apostles he would now return to heaven. When he leaves, the Holy Spirit, God, would come, would then come down and live inside each of them, giving them power and strength and guidance. After Jesus said these things, as the apostles were looking at him, Jesus was lifted up on a cloud, and it took him out of their sight. And as the apostles were watching Jesus raise up into heaven on a cloud, two angels appeared to them, and they were wearing white robes. And they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. When Jesus returns in the second time in the future, it says he comes down in the clouds and lands on the Mount of Olives, which is where they were when he went up. And he hits it with so much force, the whole mountain splits open and moves. One moves north and one moves west. He walks in, gets on a horse waiting for him, goes, defeats the Antichrist, and, and enters Jerusalem as a king for a thousand years, well, forever, actually. Okay. Let me see what time we have. And we're good. I'm going to add a little bit more about Jesus because I just can't stop talking about Jesus. This is a book that I wrote called Temptation and Trials Faced by Bible Legends. And the purpose of this book is I took 24 major characters in the Bible and I showed how each of them at some point in their lives faced major temptations or trials. And how they handled these temptations or trials, whether they followed God or not, really determined their outcome. You know, But I want to read some, a little bit about Jesus and we'll wrap it up. Because I think it shows that, aside from everything we read about Jesus, him being sinless his whole life is even maybe more profound than, than we really 
once you really think about it, it's even more in depth than, than it even looks on the surface, which is amazing. The trial and temptation of Jesus just becoming human. Jesus came to earth as a human. In God's salvation plan, just as one man, Adam, brought sin into the human race, one man, Jesus, removed sin from the human race. For him to save us, he had to become one of us. It was man that sinned, so it must be man that is punished for and fixes that sin. God the Father deemed this perfect man, Jesus, who was both 100% man and 100% God at the same time, acceptable and sufficient to take all the sins ever committed by the rest of mankind and put all their sins on Jesus, and he, with our sins on him, was punished in our place. We were able to avoid the punishment for our sins, but we get the benefit of his act. Our sins are paid for, and we are accepted as completely sinless and righteous before God because of this, as long as we come to him and ask for forgiveness and confess our sins. Now, in order for Jesus to do this, he had to come to earth and become a man. It would only be acceptable if man paid the penalty for the sins of man. Why is Jesus coming to earth to become man at trial? Because for 33 years, he had to give up being God in heaven. Think about that for a moment. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit existed forever in heaven. Um, they existed forever as God. They were not created. They're the only things that exist that were not created. They always existed, and they created everything else that exists. They created heaven, the angels, the universe, everything that exists outside the universe, whatever that may be. And the Bible clearly states that specifically God the Son, Jesus, is the one that created everything that exists in this universe. And additionally, Jesus is a source of life. And here's the quotes from the Bible. This is John chapter 1, verse 1 to 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. Not only did Jesus create everything that exists, but He also holds everything that exists together and makes everything work. This is from Colossians. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Long ago, at many times and many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in his last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So try to imagine the glory, honor, and power that Jesus has when he, before he came became man. He was a creator, sustainer, ruler of everything, everywhere. He is the one who everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth will bow down to, and the whole creation sings to him. Now, I listed Jesus coming to earth as a trial because for him to come to earth as a man, he had to give all this up for 33 years. He was born of a woman, a woman who he handmade himself, because he made everything that exists. He made Mary. He also made the people that crucified him. He was born as a man in a, a baby in a manger with dirty animals because there was no room for him at the end. He had to give up all of his God powers and live with all the limitations that we have. He was no longer the ruler of anything. He wasn't, I mean, he was God, but he wasn't the mayor of Jerusalem. He, he wasn't, he didn't have any like human authority. He could now only be in one place at one time. He got hungry, he got thirsty, he got dirty. He needed sleep and he felt pain and discomfort. During his ministry, he didn't have a home. In the Bible, it says, A scribe came up to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Although Jesus did do miracles on, on earth, there are nothing of the scope of the power he used to create the whole universe. He gave up this power and authority to become man. 
It also seemed like when he did a miracle, he would pray to his God the Father. It is possible that as you know, one of his limitations, maybe he only had power to do miracles after he prayed to God the Father, and God the Father gave him this power to do the miracles. And he gave all this up and more to come here to take the sins of the people on him, the people who continually rebelled against him, and he got punished in their place into a horrible death for people basically that rejected him. Now he could have said, no, this is too much. I'm not going to put myself through all this for people who reject me. But he didn't. He didn't. Um, he went on with the trial, lived on earth as a man for 33 years. All of the loss and suffering he would have to go through to, to do this, he did it for us. Now, I don't want to speak for God, but however, I personally, this is just me, I believe he did it because he's doing it for out of the love of his immediate family. Would you die in the place of an immediate family member? I would. When we accept and follow Jesus, the Bible says we become adopted children of God the Father and actual brothers and sisters of Jesus himself when we die and go to heaven. We become immediate family members of God because of what Jesus did for us. And the Bible says in Ephesians, in love, he predestined, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. In Galatians it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoptions as sons of God. And because you are sons, God has sent the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father so that you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, an heir through God. In Romans it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed into the image of his son, in order that Jesus might be the firstborn of many brothers. Jesus was the firstborn of many brothers. We are the rest of the brothers that are to come later after we, because we follow him. Hebrews says, Jesus who sanctifies and those who are sanctified of one source. This is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. Therefore, Jesus had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus gave up everything as God in heaven for 33 years to come here and suffer for our sake. Jesus knew that although all of mankind rebelled against him, for those who would accept him as their God, they would become part of his eternal immediate family, his own actual brothers and sisters, and adopted children of his Father in heaven for all of eternity. He did all of this to build his eternal, immediate family, which is us, if we love and follow him. The trial of the immense pressure to be completely sinless for his entire life. This blows my mind. There are at least three reasons why Jesus had to remain completely sinless his entire life for his salvation plan to work. Jesus was offering himself up to be a completely sinless, perfect sacrifice without blemish to God the Father on our behalf. God the Father would only accept a, a sinless, perfect man as an acceptable substitute for the punishment of the sins of the entire world. If Jesus sinned at any time during his lifetime here on earth, he would be, a, he would be blemished, a sinner that is no better than us and would be insufficient as a payment for our sins. That's why in the Old Testament, God the Father always demanded a sacrifice for him of an animal that had no blemish. He is a perfect God, does not accept blemished sacrifices. Therefore, Jesus had to never commit a sin during his life on earth for 33 years straight in order for him to be an acceptable sacrifice for us. Did any of us ever go weak without sinning? I haven't. You know, I tried. I'm not that good, you know. But what Jesus did was even more pressure-filled than it looks on the surface. Because by Jesus' own standards, not only could he not sin in action. He couldn't sin in word. He couldn't sin in thought. 
If Jesus had an inappropriate sinful, I mean sexual, it, 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 it's like when they're crucifying, I hate you for doing this. If he had that thought, he would have sinned. And I'm going to read the passage that show why, and he would have failed. He had to remain sinless even in thought, no matter what they did to him, for 33 years. Jesus himself, um, let's see, Jesus himself said, Jesus said this, Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hellfire. So Jesus said, you know, if you sin by saying angry things to other people, it's going to be held against you by God. However, he also, by his own standard, because he's the one that threw this out here, he said you can't even sin in thought. Jesus revealed that harboring a sinful thought is a sin, and people will be held accountable for it. This is Jesus' own words. You have heard that it is said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I, Jesus says, I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. So you can't harbor anger. It's a thought or a feeling. Jesus also said, you have heard it, it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent in his heart has already committed adultery with her. Thoughts, okay? Now, this is Jesus' own standards. As God himself, he said this. Fortunately for us, we have a Savior, okay? If we sin in thought or action or whatever, he paid for our sins. He was the Savior. There was no backup, if he sinned, there was nothing. You know, if we sin, we can be forgiven because what he did. If he sinned, he was he there was he was the savior. There was no backup. He couldn't even sin in thought by his own standards. So think about that. When they're spitting in his face, and when they're crucifying him, and when the religious leaders are saying, you know, you're the devil and this and that, he couldn't have an inappropriate, angry sin. Now he did lash out in anger once when when he cleaned out the the temple with the money changers, but it's probably an appropriate thing. Like I chased them out. He could not have a lustful, hateful, vengeful. No matter. And when they're crucifying, what do you say to them? Father, forgive them. You know, isn't that mind blowing? What he did for us. And if he failed, where would we be? Makes you love me even more, huh? All right. Well, that's where we'll wrap it up today, okay? What we're going to do next week, we're going to the Acts of the Apostles. We're going to see what happens when the Holy Spirit hops into some guys that are kind of cowardly without God. We're going to see the Apostles turn into these supermen, basically, because they have God in them and do stuff they can never do. Even when they're with Jesus, they didn't do the stuff that they did when the Holy Spirit got in them. So the, we're going to cover the book of Acts. And, and that will take place for uh, one week, and we're going to get into all the letters. And the letters are great because it's all teaching about Jesus. From here on out, it's all about Jesus. You know, Acts is really interesting because you get to see what happens with Peter, but especially Paul. How uh, Paul, you know, went from a persecutor Christian to the biggest advocate, but all the different things he had to go through, and it's just basically like the story of Paul running all over the place, preaching Jesus, you know, no matter what, and people chasing him, and it's really good, you know. All right, so listen, God bless all of you. I'm glad you came. Again, if you ever miss it or whatever, it's on YouTube. Just look it up. How are these working out for you? Good, yeah. We're a little mad past two-thirds done now, you know? And, uh, oh, real quick, interesting. I told you my personal story a couple of I told you the thing about the tumor, but also how, you know, one time God appeared to me, and he appeared to me 1999 and said, listen, I'm God. I want you to follow me. I want you to learn about me. And I said, I will. And I felt the Holy Spirit rush. And all of a sudden, I had this urge to read the Bible. I never read it before. I started reading it. And I read it cover to cover like ten, nine times now, right? And he showed up again in 2017. And he said, you're, you're, you need to do more. You're not doing enough. You know, what do you want me to do? And he said, you know, I want you to get my word into people's hands. And he gave me this vision of somebody, it's a woman at St. Joe's in the vestibule reading something I've written. I had no, no idea what he's talking about. I didn't write anything yet. And then all these books came to me, right? Well, you now I have six books out. I have two more coming out. I'm doing, I'm doing this. You know, I have the YouTube channel. Everything that he told me to do, I did, and it's working out. Except for this book. 
the first three books that I've written, I just had these ideas for a book that I came across the Bible and felt like he wanted me to write it and I wrote them and I got it out. And after three books, I was done. It was a Saturday morning, I was lying in bed and he woke me up with all the ideas for his book out of the blue. They weren't my ideas, they were his. He showed me all the people in the Bible that faced all these temptations and trials. He wanted me to write about them. And I said, no, I'm tired. No, and, he's, and he, the ideas were flooding in. Like, no, I just, I'm, I'm, no. So after it was overwhelming, so said, I was laughing. All right, at least, at least let me get a cup of coffee. You know, <laughs> I did. I said, at least let me get a cup of coffee, God. And I did. And I sat down, and he pushed me to write this book harder than any other book. I, I blew through it in like six weeks, and every day I'm working on it, and I felt like it was maybe my best book or whatever, and it didn't sell at all. Everything else was successful. This book did not sell. And out of all the stuff he did, everything worked, and I never understood, not just why he's in some, but why did you push me so hard to write this book? And it's not telling, I never understood that. Well, we were at a, a church leadership meeting, the first one that they had two weeks ago or whatever, and Teak and Tony Campanell came up to me. And he said, I really, you know, I haven't been at your Bible teaching, but I heard it's going really well, and I, I really like it, and I want, you to, I want you to do another teaching when you're done with the Bible. And I said, what? He said, I want you to get in front of the church like you're doing now and do another series, but I want you to teach the Bible, but then teach the people how to incorporate the lessons in the Bible into their own lives, you know? I'm thinking, okay, well, all right, yeah, that'd be awesome. And I'm thinking, what am I gonna write about? And I look, that's what this whole book is. That's all this book is, is lessons, trial and error that, that, that the people in the Bible did in their lives. And I thought, oh my goodness. God appeared to me two years ago pushed me to write this book. I had no idea why he had me write it. It wasn't my idea. He woke me up out of bed. It wouldn't leave me alone until I wrote it. I had no idea why I wasn't selling. And it's because two years later, Deacon said, I want you to basically teach this book to our church. He didn't even know it existed. So I'm going to probably do that next year. You know? Cool story, huh? Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, that's it for this week. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I thank you, thank you, thank you. Hello. <laughs> awesome job. That was a great. Uh, oh, thanks, yeah. Yeah. He, from, from Jesus, you know, his stepfather, Mary's husband. Yeah. Yeah. From ages 12 to 30, nothing's written about Jesus. And Joseph was with them at 12, and when we pick it back up, and Jesus starts ministry, he's gone. So at some point during that, it, he died, but it doesn't say. It doesn't say what happened to him. He's just not there anymore. You know? And so it doesn't give any details what happened to him. Somehow he died during that point, but we don't, we don't know. You know. But it happened somewhere between the ages of 12 and 30 of Jesus. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, one other question. What's your perspective on... Uh... Let me just turn this off. Okay. Yeah.